Our next uh, speaker is Frank Gordon, and he got his uh, doctorate in engineering from the University of uh, Kansas back in 71. After that, he served 38 years with the U.S. Navy. And during that time, while running spa wars out in the West Coast, he managed to carve out a whole field of coal fusion with uh, Stan Spock and Larry Forsley, Pam Boss, and uh, we will hear about what he's learned about co-deposition. Okay, well, thank you, Mitchell, and uh, this, I'd like to start out with thanking Mitchell again for organizing this. It's uh, having been a co-chair for a, one of the ICCFs, uh, I can't imagine one person doing this and doing it again and again and again. Some of us are, are faster learners than that, I guess. But uh, anyhow, I also want to compliment you on, on organizing it at spring here in Boston. Uh, two weeks ago when I was preparing this, uh, this is what I thought I would say, you know, it must be spring. <laughs> this was after about the third polar vortex had, had made its way through and I actually think we've got one more on the way before uh, spring. A year ago at this time, I think, I think you, uh, Boston got hit. And, and I put this in, this next slide in for David French. Uh, one time I was talking to him. And, and he said it was cold in, in uh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I thought this was just a, a figure of speech. So, in, in any event, uh, it takes some of you a little longer to catch, to see, to see what you're <laughs> But, uh, anyhow. Okay, so on, on with the presentation. Uh, there, this previous presentation actually was an ideal lead-in to, to what I would hope to say. And, and I guess the conclusion of what I'm going to say uh, is probably going to lead to more discussion rather than, than uh, conclusions. Uh, the benefit of these types of conferences typically is the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one and in small groups and talk about things. And I'm hoping that that's what uh, this presentation leads to. Uh, so the summary is, you know, a wide variety of co-deposition protocols have been used. And we just heard about a, uh, another one. Uh, Magnetic, electric fields, ultrasonic fields, other forms of stimulation seem to be important. Uh, Fukai is a name that uh, a lot of you probably haven't heard of, and I'm going to talk about some work he's done. He's a uh, material scientist and, and did not know he was doing what uh, coal fusion work at the time he did his work. And then the implications uh, to, these, to these results. Uh, the evolution of, of co-deposition is starting in 89 when Pons and Fleischmann did their result. Mike McCubrey has a statement that says, any scientist worth his salt always has a better idea. They never follow what, what the other person did. And that was certainly the case with Stan Spock. Uh, he thought immediately that the better idea was co-deposition. In fact, uh, you know, while everyone else was out finding palladium rods or wires to, to do the experiment, uh, Stan found some palladium chloride and did a co-deposition experiment. That was the first experiments that were done in, at the Navy lab and, and, uh, and for a long time, you know, continued to work with that. Uh, many others have used co-deposition and, and, and I haven't attempted to list all of them, but I do want to focus in later on some work, the uh, recent work by uh, Lutz and Hagelstein uh, was actually published in, in uh, JCMNS in uh, 1912, uh, 2012, and uh, was was presented parts of it at ICCF 17 in in Korea. I didn't pick up on the significance of it until just recently, or what I think the significance. Uh, this was one of the first co-deposition experiments that we did in in San Diego with you know Pam Boss and Stan Spock. We took some palladium chloride, a, an electrode, a couple of thermocouples. And after a very few minutes, you can see that the solution warmed up and was warmer than, than I mean, the hotter, the cathode was warmer than the solution. So this was not something that should happen. If you have joule heating, clearly the solution should, should warm up faster. And, and so this was evidence that, that the heat was being produced at the cathode. We did not do, even attempt to do precision calorimetry in San Diego. Um, we, you know, just didn't t spend the time doing that, but did a lot of work for just measuring the, the cathode. Also, here when we turned the experiment off, we saw the temperature rise on, on, the, on the metal, on the cathode, and then uh, 
the solution followed. This was the heat after death that uh, Fleischman talked about, and we were able to see that. And this was published in Journal Electrochemical Analysis in, in 1991. Uh, one of the other experiments we did a few years later was an IR examination of the cathode as, as it was going, and, and, and you can see. Now, this is in real time, so you can see in a matter of a few seconds uh, how much the cathode is heating up, and, and uh, Dave Nagel did some later analysis based on the size and the time and all that and concluded that, that these had to be nuclear events that were, were causing this kind of, of a heat, heat production. Uh, we showed this, these results to Lowell Wood from Lawrence Livermore Lab and he said, hey, you guys are in the Navy, you should put a transducer in there because if these are little mini explosions, you should hear them. Uh, we again, being scientists, thought we had a better idea and that was to take the, the uh, piezoelectric and ferroelectric material and, and co-deposit right on to that. And when we did, we were able to see uh, pressure spikes followed by a, a thermal increase in, in, you know, the piezo or pyroelectric materials, both piezo and pyro sensitive. And so it would measure both, both the pressure and also the temperature. When we looked at the different surfaces, uh, you know, here's the co-deposition without the magnetic and electric field. Went, when we applied an electric field, we saw some different morphology and a magnetic field clearly showed a different morphology. One of the, the features of co-deposition was it, it gives us a possibility or opportunity to really check and see, see what's happening with a lot of things. And, and these results, again, were published in, in 2005 and 2007, although the work was done in actually some of fairly early in the 90s. When I talked to Stan about what are the electrochemical processes involved, and, and he, the, the typical protocol that we have used in San Diego involves, you start out with a very low uh, current density. And the reason is you want to be below the, the diffusion limiting current. Uh, this is to give us a nice solid deposition or plating out so, so that it, we get good adhesion. Uh, then we raise the current above the diffusion limiting current and now you start seeing evolution of, of hydrogen or deuterium. And, and as it continues to plate out, the, the uh, palladium chloride or nickel chloride in the solution is, is plated out. And, and ultimately, now this is really an exponential curve that, that goes on out, uh, but ultimately it gets down where the, where the solution clears and then uh, we typically raise the, the current level to stabilize the, the material on the electrode. So this, this is the process that we've used and and uh, we've been primarily focusing on, on nuclear products. You know, one of the questions was, you know, prove it's nuclear. If someone can prove it's nuclear, then we'll fund it. Well, uh, <laughs> the, you know, the, remember when one neutron, if they can produce one neutron, that would be enough. You know, this was in 1989 when they were, when they were making their comments. Well, uh, in a year ago, uh, we got a, a patent uh, that on the production of high energy neutrons, it was actually awarded to the Spay War uh, for producing neutrons. We haven't seen a lot of funding based on that patent, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, recently one of the blogs, I think, in Italy said that the U.S. government has officially recognized coal fusion because they, they have given a patent for, for this process. Uh, one of the other experiments that we've done is, is looking at deuterium update, uptake, and this was done in 19, published in 1994. Uh, after we do the, the initial plating, when we raise the current above the, the, the uh, diffusion limiting current, uh, within just a few seconds, then we, we reverse the current and look and determine how much hydrogen had been or, or deuterium had, had been deposited at that time, which then came out. And, and since it takes twice as many electrons to plate uh, a palladium as it does a, uh, a deuterium, so, so two-thirds of the energy along this line is, let's say this eight seconds, would have been plating out palladium, one-third would have been plating out deuterium, and when we reverse the current, uh, we see that the, we're getting 
you know, now there's some, you know, where did where do you really put this second line? But uh, uh, we see that we're getting uh, high loading in just a matter of seconds as as we're plating out. Uh, other experiments we did that published this in '99 showed that that the excess enthalpy also occurs fairly quickly. You know, initially it's it's endothermic, and then very quickly shifts to exothermic, and and we see the production going up. So, uh, again, more evidence. I, I threw the Galileo protocol up here because. Uh, you know, they decide, hey, if we had a, an experiment, this was another idea, if we have an experiment that a lot of people can do and they all get good results, then someone will have to recognize that this is valid and, and we'll all get funded. So the idea was let's do a, a, a protocol that if people follow, they will get results. And so Pam Boss uh, very carefully wrote down a protocol for people to follow and, and this was tested with a a group of about a half a dozen different uh, people tried it. Now, unfortunately, all of these half dozen people were scientists and they all thought they had a better idea. So I don't know how many actually followed the protocol. <laughs> um, the interesting thing is, though, most of them got results. And, and uh, I remember the Littles in Texas uh, put a thing, on, a, a little video on the web. They said they had seven cells running. They were all producing excess heat, uh, they had they went straight to a high current level. They didn't start out with a low threshold. And, and when we had done that in some of our experiments, we saw, we, first of all, you don't get very good adhesion. And second, the, the plating is very mossy. Uh, but it's still, you know, they were very excited about it. Uh, two weeks later, they completely changed for some reason. Uh, I guess that's typical. Uh, but others saw also, you know, using CR39, saw that they were able to produce uh, particles, and, and these were people at SRI, uh, Berkeley, uh, several people, uh, you know, Oriani and others, uh, all saw evidence of particles in the CR39. So, so the, the takeaway here is that that uh, co-deposition must be pretty robust because. It's hard to screw it up. Uh, okay, now let me jump to the uh, Let's Hagelstein paper. They tried co-deposition, and, and uh, Dennis Letts has, has actually made a very nice calorimeter, has, has done a lot of work in this calorimeter. And so they tried the Spock protocol now, uh, uh, 0.3 molar lithium chloride 0.5 molar O5 palladium chloride and D2O um, following a current profile similar to what Pam had put together in a steps and and